Okay, I am I am back. Uh, hopefully you can pick this up. Uh, Satan must not be too happy with what I'm talking about here tonight. Uh, somehow, in some way, we got cut off. So now this is going to be somewhat of a two-part lesson uh, as we upload it on uh, YouTube. But I hope that you will come back in if you have been cut off. Uh, I'm going to give you a few minutes. Uh, it is saying that I'm back on live now. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes uh, to finish up this, this lesson. Uh, I apologize for that. I'm not really sure uh, why uh, we lost our connection. I see two people have, have come back. But the last was I was talking about was the fact that Jesus acknowledged the power of Scripture. He kept saying, it is written. He used the power of God's word to combat Satan. And as I was reading that uh, before we were disconnected, one of the things that uh, is really, really uh, important for us to remember is that that has been Satan's tactic since the very beginning of time. When Satan went to tempt Adam and Eve in the garden, he was trying to get them to doubt the word of God. When they said, had not God commanded us that we can eat of all the trees in the garden, but of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, we can't eat of it lest we die. And Satan tried to get them to doubt, and he got them to doubt the word of God because he said, ye shall not surely die. And so ever since that time, Satan has been trying to get man to doubt the word of God. So even when I think about these discussions about the so-called lost books of the Bible, and they're being omitted, or they're here, or they're there, keep in mind, if you will, that this is another strategy of our adversary to get us to doubt God's word. If he can get us to doubt God's word, then we won't obey God's word. And if we don't obey God's word, we won't have a relationship with God. And we won't spend eternity with him, which is what Satan wants. I just think that's important to remember. Jesus acknowledged the power of scripture. It is written. And if you and I are going to combat Satan, even in 2021, we have to be able to say, it is written. So he acknowledged the power of Scripture, and he fulfills the prophecies of, of Scripture. That's the fifth thing. Jesus literally fulfilled hundreds of messianic prophecies. Again, uh, Josh McDowell's original book was Evidence That Demands a Verdict that was published in 1979. And then he published another book that says More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And this version that I have now is the comp compilation of both of those, Evidence for Christianity, Historical Evidences for the Christian Faith, uh, that was published in 2006. But he says that literally Jesus fulfilled hundreds of messianic prophecies. For example, Christ was born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Uh, he suffered and died on a cross. Psalm 22. Matthew 27 verse 46. John 19, 28. And he rose from the dead. Isaiah 53, verse 9 and 10. Psalm 16, verse 10. And Matthew 28. So he fulfilled the prophecies of Scripture. He acknowledged the power of Scripture. He came to fulfill Scripture. He was the theme of Scripture. And then number six, he corroborated the truths of scripture so number one 
He was the theme of scripture. Number two, he came to fulfill scripture. Number three, he believed the words of scripture. Number four, he acknowledged the power of scripture. Number five, he fulfilled the prophecies of scripture. And then number six, he corroborated the truths of scripture. For instance, Adam and Eve. In Matthew 19, 4 and 5, Christ said, quote, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this call shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's a reference to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Jesus did not believe in progressive creation or theistic evolution. He believed in creation as recorded in Genesis. Or what about the flood? Jesus believed in a literal Noah and a literal flood. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 and 38, he said, quote, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Unquote. Abraham's hope. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 says, Abraham was justified by faith. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham, a real person. Circumcision. Jesus confirmed the teaching of circumcision in the Old Testament. In John chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. John chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the Father. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So Jesus acknowledges that these things really happen. Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus confirmed the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife, and Lot's wife. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that, that city. And the context is this. Jesus said, verse 12, And when you come into a house, salute it. And if a house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. Verse 14, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that, that city. Luke chapter 17, verse 29, verse number 32. This is what Jesus says. He says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And in verse number 32, he said, Remember Lot's wife. 
So there's the burning bush. Jesus confirmed the miraculous call of Moses in Mark chapter 12, verse number 26. Manna from heaven in John chapter 6, verse 31, all the way through verse 51. Jesus spoke of the manna that was provided for the children of Israel in the wilderness. Time and again, Christ repeatedly confirmed the authority of the Old Testament. In addition, he established the sufficiency of Scripture to save mankind. Luke chapter 16, verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In context, his point was miracles are not necessary for men to be saved. All that is needed is the word of the prophets. He who is the truth, and we talk about that all the time from John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He who is the truth knew, believed, and submit it to the inspired writings with no reservations. There were only three possibilities concerning Jesus' testimony to Scripture. One, there are no errors in Scripture. Or number two, there are errors, but Jesus didn't know them and therefore was not God. Or number three, there are errors and he knew about them but covered them up and not holy. If God is holy, if Christ is holy, then we must believe that the Bible is the word of God. The belief in the deity of Jesus Christ demands a belief in the verbal plenary inspiration of scripture. I say to all of you who are listening, if you believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, then you must of necessity believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of scripture. That's the testimony of Jesus. Let's look at the testimony of the Holy Spirit before we conclude tonight. The testimony of Jesus and the authors of Scripture are objective. The testimony of the Holy Spirit is somewhat subjective. After we understand why it is reasonable to believe the Bible, it is the Holy Spirit who brings about that belief because Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The effects of sin must be overcome by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, utilizing the word of God, the sword of the spirit to convert us. The entire human race was affected by the fall of Adam and Eve. And so our problem is not moral, or is moral rather, and not intellectual. Man does not reject truth because it's hard to understand. Man rejects truth because he's hostile to it and doesn't want to accept it. I want to repeat that. Mankind's problem is moral, not intellectual. Man doesn't reject truth because it's hard to understand, but because he is hostile to it and doesn't want to accept it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, this, quote, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Man and woman, 
or man in generic will remain hostile and reject truth unless he's enlightened by the Holy Spirit. You see, I can preach the word, but preaching the word alone doesn't convince you to believe the Bible. You have to will to understand. You have to want to understand. You have to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to take that word and convict you. So why should we bother to give evidence of the Bible's authority? Because as I quoted to you earlier, of what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter, chapter 3, and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. meekness and fear. Be ready always. But in order to be ready always, you have to first of all sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness, in meekness, and in fear. When the word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit takes that word and convicts us. That's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, and let's look at Romans chapter 10. I was blessed, we were blessed to have one of our neighbors to visit us at the services on this past Sunday. She usually sees me out working in the yard and uh, she's come over to speak from time to time and uh, she's uh, just trying to be neighborly. And so when we talked last week, she wanted to come. She said, I think I want to come visit service. And, she told me some of her thoughts and some of, of the wounds that she had had inflicted upon her uh, in religion in the past. And I told her the time, and, and she actually showed up, and, and she said that she really enjoyed the service. She said she was blessed with, with my sermon, The Joy of the Lord is Your Strength. And she, she felt welcomed by the members. And, and I just say to university, thank you. Thank you so very much for uh, allowing the love of God to be shed abroad in your heart and to, and to come out to her. But, but she said to me Monday when I went back to my, my regular clothes and my yard work, she said, you preach with such conviction. And I said to her, the reason I preach with conviction because I believe what I preach. It's the word of God that convicts us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. So it says in Romans chapter 10, starting at verse, I'm going to start at verse 8. But what saith that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11 says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Talking about 
Jesus. Verse 12, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Watch this, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, it's not just talking about an audible call, something coming from your voice. It's talking about calling upon the authority of his name by submitting to his commands to do what he says to be saved. But he says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God hearing by the word of God. The spirit of God and the word of God work together to give witness of the Bible's authority. So this is the foundation that I've laid last week and, and this week. Again, I apologize for um, some reason we were cut off there a little while ago. But the case for the inspiration of scripture is solid because of the combined witness of the writers of scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. In Colossians chapter three, verse 16, the Bible says this, Paul wrote this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, you richly. That means it permeates. It's all inside of you. You, you. you know the difference between rich desserts and just desserts, don't you? You can literally taste the sweetness in rich dessert. You, you can almost taste the calories even. He's saying that we ought to so take in the word of God, the word of Christ. Our mind should be a tablet where the word of God is written. Yet we must not only hear the word of God, but also obey it. James says in James 1.22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Let me ask you a question. If I don't have the word of God, if, if some of it is missing, how can I obey it? And God would not be just to condemn me if somehow in some way he hasn't protected his word to see that what we needed to know has gotten to us. As a matter of fact, it's what I think about when Moses wrote in Deuteronomy, I think it's 29, 29, that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things that have been revealed belong unto us and to our children. As we go through this study and as, as, as we reason together, and that's all I want us to do, as we reason together, I'm just asking you to be honest with Scripture. And as we reason together that you understand it's not what's missing or supposedly missing that has gotten man in trouble. It's what's written that man is not obeying is what's causing our problem. 
That's why Jesus said, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. It has been said, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. The Bible is our greatest treasure. May it dwell richly in each of us. I hope tonight's study, second foundation study, has been a blessing to you. Again, that you will not only come back again next week as we continue to study uh, Christian evidences or apologetics as it is known, which is to give a defense for why we believe what we believe. Invite your friends, relatives, co-workers, associates, neighbors, um, so that they can hear us defend why we believe what, what we believe. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching tonight or later on when it's uploaded to YouTube or you're watching when later on Facebook, and you're not a Christian, this same book tells you how. You see, our God is, is so just and so righteous that he knew we needed to be saved. And he gave us a plan, a scheme of redemption that we could understand so that we could be saved. A plan that he had devised before the very beginning of time in eternity past, Paul says to the church of Rome, he said it used to be a mystery, but now it's no longer a mystery that the Jews and Gentiles will be fellow heirs and members of the same body, same church, same family. By the way, Paul says, the whole family of God in heaven and earth is called by one name. Wow. What do you need to do to become a part of the body of Christ, the family of God, the bride of Christ? What do you need to do to become a Christian, a child of God, one who belongs to Christ? What do you need to do in order to have all your past sins forgiven and get the down payment of the Holy Spirit? Let me give it to you and then the lesson will be yours. Hear the gospel. I've already read Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The gospel is God's power unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Romans 1, verse 14 through about verse 17. It is about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Once you hear that message that Jesus died for your sins, was buried got up from the dead, ascended back to heaven, and one day is coming back again. You need to be willing to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. He said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your, your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. You need to repent of your sins. Change your mind, change your will, change your action. Luke 13, 3 and 5, Acts 17 and 30. You need to confess with the mouth, Jesus Christ is God's son. I just read it, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, Matthew 10, verse 32. And then you need to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27, 1 Peter 3 and verse number 21, wherefore baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Thank you so much for joining us in our study tonight. And my prayer is that it has been a blessing to you. Would you bow with me as we close out in a word of prayer? Gracious and all wise Father who art in heaven, you are holy, you are righteous, and you are just. We humbly bow before you, thanking you for grace and mercy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to teach your word. And my prayer, O oh God, is that I have rightly divided your word. I pray that you have been glorified. And Jesus Christ has been lifted up so all might be drawn to him. May your children have been strengthened and encouraged and built up in the most holy and precious faith. And Father, my prayer is that 
your Holy Spirit will take the lesson tonight and convict the heart of some precious soul who needs to respond in humble obedience to the gospel of Christ before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Our prayer is that they will call us at our number that should be showing up or our email address that's showing up or go to our website. And if they are outside of the Cleveland area, uh, we will be glad to help them get in contact with someone who will help them and their obedience to the gospel. Bless those who need to be restored. May these lessons encourage and strengthen them. Again, be with Brother Brian Draper, his surgery in the morning, his wife Shante and their children. Be with our new convert, uh, Brother Samuel Pinner, as well as all of our other new converts. Uh, may we protect them from, from the wicked one, the evil one. Be with uh, my sister Sherilyn and her husband Alfred and their son Ben in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Please uh, heal them, raise them up from COVID-19 and all, all of the other sick and shut in and all of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Thank you for your word. And Father, forgive me if I have fallen short in the teaching of that word for what is my desire to simply do your will. May your Holy Spirit take the word and convict us all. Thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. For all of you are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, remember that God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake.